Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Alberto Bertuco. I'm the director of the Center of Ready Cases for Energy, Economics and Technology at the University of Padova. And today we are here for a third event of this uh, spring program of our center. And uh, I'm very pleased to announce that this event has been co-sponsored by University of Padova and University of Trieste, where a similar center is operating. Uh, today, it's for us uh, honor and pleasure to host uh, a special lecture by Professor Mark Jacobson, who is the director of the Atmosphere Energy Program at the Stanford University in California. So uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Jacobson very much for this uh, lecture. And uh, the program of uh, this afternoon is, uh, is very simple. There will be a lecture by Professor Jacobson, and uh, at the end uh, we can ask questions. However, the total allotted time for this event is one hour and a half, so by four o'clock uh, Italian time, everything will be finished. So, uh, all of you who would like to uh, ask a question to Professor Jacobson are kindly invited to write in the chat their name and the question. Okay, in the end, uh, here from the control room, uh, we will uh, uh, enable the people to make the question. All right, so that's all for our organization. I please uh, mark uh, the stage is yours, uh, and uh, whenever you like, uh, you can start uh, with your lecture. Thank you again. Yes. One, one moment, please. One moment, please. Um, today, I want to talk about uh, transitioning countries and states and cities and towns all entirely to clean renewable energy to address climate change and air pollution and energy insecurity. And so let's um, look at that. There are three main reasons that we're focusing on a 100% clean renewable energy in these solutions. Uh, one is air pollution which causes about 7 million uh, deaths per year worldwide. Uh, and most of these are due to particles in air pollution. 90% are due to particles. And most of these deaths are also in developing countries. And less than half are due to indoor air pollution from indoor burning of biofuels and uh, well, solid fuels, including biomass, bio uh, dung, and wood, and also some coal. But the cost of air pollution is on the order of $30 trillion per year based on statistical cost of life. Uh, global warming is a rising problem and is already causing significant damage and is estimated to cost on the order of $30 trillion per year also by 2050. Um, there are also several types of energy insecurity issues. Uh, there are actually four types of energy insecurity issues we're trying to address uh, through these clean renewable energy plans. Uh, well, the first is the fact that fossil fuels and uranium are very limited resources and will run out over time. And that will result in uh, energy price instability. And that will result in uh, political and social instability as well if we, didn't have, if we don't have a replacement. Now, the second type of energy insecurity is the fact that we have a lot of centralized power plants and refineries and that creates chaos when one of them goes down. The, if one power plant, a large power plant goes down, then large sections of a city can lose power. Whereas more distributed energy allows, uh, it makes it more difficult for large sections of a city to go down if one wind turbine or one set of solar panels uh, goes down on the grid, whether it's by, uh, due to uh, maintenance problems or due to terrorism or something else. Uh, the third type of energy insecurity problem is the one we're seeing play out in front of us today, which is when one country has significant control of the supply of fossil fuel, usually uh, of another country. 
Um, so for example, Russia has a significant supply of natural gas that it supplies to Europe. And that when you have conflict like you do today, uh, that can lead to uh, either being the fuel being held hostage or in this case, sanctions being imposed and that causes costs to rise uh, for everybody due to the lack of the fuel. But it's not only, not only the international trading of fuels that and the long distance transport, the, the long distance um, exchange of fuels that is a problem. It's also long distance transport. Like there are many island countries that rely on the transport of fossil fuels for their uh, energy. And this causes costs to rise significantly. For example, in American Samoa, the cost of electricity is over 50 cents per kilowatt hour uh, compared to less than 20 cents a kilowatt hour in the, in the US mainland. Even Hawaii has a cost of electricity that's over 35 cents per kilowatt hour because you have to transport fossil fuels, oil and gas, mostly uh, long distance or in diesel, a lot of uh, island countries use diesel fuel. So that's the third type. Then the final type of energy insecurity we're trying to solve is just the risks of uh, fossil fuel and nuclear infrastructures. Uh, with nuclear, we have meltdown risk, waste risk, issues, weapons proliferation risk, uh, uranium mining risk for lung cancer. Uh, for fossil fuels, we have mining risk and air pollution impacts. So these are additional energy insecurity risks that um, we can avoid if we transition to clean renewable energy. So our idea is to electrify all energy sectors or provide direct heat for some energy and provide the electricity and heat with entirely clean renewable energy, namely wind and water and solar power. And we define wind, water, and solar as onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power, uh, solar thermal for heat, uh, hydroelectric power, uh, geothermal power, we consider part of the water just because we wanna keep a simple acronym, uh, and tidal and wave power as well. Uh, so that's, the, and then some geothermal heat as well. So those are the sources of electricity and heat. And we would electrify all transportation. So using either battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell uh, vehicles, where hydrogen fuel cell vehicles would be, li would be limited to large, long distance heavy transport. So long distance aircraft, long distance ships, long distance uh, trains and some trucks, but not uh, passenger vehicles, for example. And speaking of hydrogen, we only support green hydrogen, which is hydrogen produced from wind, water, and solar through electrolysis. And the only applications of hydrogen we support are transport, long distance heavy transport for steel production and some other industrial processes and uh, providing electricity and heat for some remote microgrids. But we do not support hydrogen for uh, passenger vehicles, small, small vehicles, for home heating or for grid electricity because batteries are just much more efficient uh, for grid electricity storage than is hydrogen storage. And it just you just need a lot more renewable energy sources to produce that hydrogen and then to store it and then to use it in a fuel cell than you would to run it through a battery. Uh, for buildings, we would electrify those with heat pumps, replacing natural gas heaters for air uh, heating and also cooling. And we'd use, uh, we'd use heat pump water heaters for water heating. Uh, we'd use induction, electric induction cooktops for, uh, for cooking. We'd replace all gas appliances in homes with electric equivalents. We'd have some district heating and cooling, and then there'd be some geothermal and solar direct heat. For industry, we'd electrify that as well with electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces, dielectric heaters, electron beam heaters. These are all existing technologies. In fact, we have over 95% of the technologies we need to transition the world for all, for all purposes. The technologies we don't have right now are long distance aircraft and ships, which would probably run on hydrogen fuel cells, uh, but we know how to do that. So it's really a question of implementing those. And also we don't have some industrial um, processes transitioned yet uh, commercially. So, but again, we still, we know how to do that. Now we'll, we'll need storage with 100% clean renewable energy, and we need electricity storage, heat storage, cold storage, and also hydrogen storage. 
There are many electricity options already available, concentrated solar power with storage, pumped hydro storage, existing hydroelectric dams or form of storage, batteries, flywheels, compressed air, gravitational storage of solid masses. Uh, these are all existing technologies. For heating cooling, well, the most common type of storage worldwide for both is water tank storage. There's also ice storage for cooling. And then for heating, there's underground borehole water pit and aquifer storage. Aquifer storage has also been used for cooling storage as well. And then in building materials. And then hydrogen is a form of storage, as I mentioned. Now, I'll just give you some examples of uh, some types of storage that are being used. Um, Stanford University, actually where I work, is now 100% renewable for all buildings as well in terms of electricity, but also in terms of heating and cooling. So it's actually now the first university in the world to be 100% renewable for heating, cooling, and electricity. And what they did was uh, for the, in 2016, 80% of the campus electricity and heat was powered by natural gas cogeneration. That was bulldozed and replaced with a fourth generation district heating and cooling system, which you can see here. There were about 35 miles of cooling pipes and 35 miles of, of heating pipes laid around the university. There are two chillers and a boiler, which you can see here. And there are heat pumps that raise the temperature of the hot water and lower the temperature of the cold water. The heat pumps run on electricity and so provide the heating and cooling for all the buildings through pipe, through district heating and cooling system. And then the university purchased uh, on the order of 150 megawatts of solar photovoltaics in two power plants in California. And 10 megawatts of that is on rooftops in the, on the university campus. So from the solar photovoltaics powering the electricity and powering the heating and cooling for these fourth generation heating and cooling system, uh, the university is now 100% renewable, which is good news. Um, this can be replicated uh, in many universities, not only, but also other types of facilities where you have large numbers of buildings. Um, another type of district heating system is underground borehole storage. Uh, this is a community in Okotoks, Canada, which is powerful of Calgary, where it's very sunny during the summer where the days are long. So in 2004 and five, there are 52 homes built uh, with these solar collectors on the roofs of the garages, as the left, top left uh, photograph. And in, that, in those solar collectors are a glycol solution. During the summer, the glycol solution gets heated and piped to this building on the right, where the heat gets transferred to water. The water is then piped underground, where there were uh, this field is excavated and filled with U-shaped uh, pipes that go down about 30 meters. The hot water then it exchanges its heat with the soil to heat the soil. The soil gets heated up and it was, the soil was covered and with this field where children play on. And that heat gets stored until winter time or whenever it's needed. And when the snow is on the ground in the winter time, like on the bottom left, then the whole system is run in reverse and that heat uh, is extracted from the soil and sent by water um, first to the building but then back to the to the uh, homes and provides 100 percent of the heating wintertime heating for these 52 homes and this is really actually inexpensive storage it's not very efficient it's a, well it's about a round trip efficiency of on the order of 56 percent which sounds not very efficient but the cost is so low it's less than $1 per kilowatt hour of storage compared to, this is heat storage, but batteries, for example, are 100 to $200 per kilowatt hour of storage. So it's very inexpensive uh, storage and it provides uh, reliable heating uh, for these homes. Um, here's another uh, type of district heating system. This is in Vogens, Denmark. It's water pit storage. So on the left is a big swimming pool-like structure that's filled with water and covered with insulation. And during the summer, these solar collectors will collect heat and heat the water up to 80 degrees Celsius. And that water gets stored until winter time where it provides uh, heat for the 2,500 um, homes in this town. So, and then one more type of kind of district cooling storage, this is um, ice cooling. 
actually in 1998, uh, my university also had a big ice cube under a building such as this. And during the day uh, in the summer when it got very hot, uh, instead, of, in, instead of using air conditioning, which requires electricity and causes blackouts in California because that's when the most electricity is used is in the hot summer afternoons. Instead of doing that during the night, uh, when electricity prices were low, water would be, uh, ice would be formed such as this. And then during the day, when cooling was needed, water is run through the coils in the ice and then sent to the buildings to cool the buildings and, instead of using air conditioning. And this requires no electricity here during the day. So this is basically like battery electric storage uh, because it serves the same purpose as a battery. Uh, but it costs less than $40 per kilowatt hour versus now $100 to $200 per kilowatt hour for batteries. Okay, so before I talk about plans for Italy and the world to run on 100% clean renewable energy, I want to talk about transitioning an individual home. And I'm going to talk about my own home, which I built uh, in 2017. And I made sure there was no natural gas on the property. It's all electric and it powers itself in the annual average. Uh, in fact, it more than powers itself. There are 13.6 kilowatts of solar PV on the rooftop. And I have uh, four Tesla wall mount batteries. These are first generation. So each one is about 3.3 kilowatt peak discharge and around 6.6 .6 kilowatt hours of storage capacity, which means uh, that this, the, the storage, if you're discharging it at its peak, it has two hours of storage. But because there are four of them, you can, it's, it's really um, flexible in the sense that you can either discharge at 3.3 kilowatts for eight hours because you just run one after the other. So they're basically concatenated together to provide um, either eight hours of storage at 3.3 kilowatts, uh, or you can run 13.2 kilowatts for two hours. Um, so that's why these you know, concatenate are very full with of storing power. Uh, in fact, you can imagine either two hour batteries or four hour batteries, both of which exist. And let's say you have 25 four hour batteries, well, that gives you 100 hours of storage. Or if you have 100 four hour batteries, that's 400 hours of storage. So we already have long term, long duration electricity storage simply by concatenating batteries together. And the advantage of that is you can also run them simultaneously. So if you have 100 uh, four-hour batteries and each one, uh, let's say, has a peak discharge rate of 10 kilowatts, 100 times 10 is 1,000. So you have 1,000 kilowatts of instantaneous storage or instantaneous release potential for four hours. Uh, or you have 400 hours of storage at 10 kilowatts or anything in between. So this is really important for keeping the grid stable. One of the ways to keep the grid stable is basically just using four hour batteries and concatenating them. Uh, and in fact, that's what I'm gonna show you later that that's how one of the ways we keep the grid stable in any country in the world. Now for heating and cooling, I have heat pumps and this is for air heating and cooling. So these are called ductless mini split heat pump air heaters and air conditioners. So there are no ducts to send heat through, uh, through the building. Instead, in each room, there's one of these devices like on the left uh, near, near the ceiling. And, and so let's say I have not, um, around 10 or 11 of these. And then there are two outside units like on the right, which exchange heat with the air outside. So these are air source heat pumps. And they just, the only connection is there's a tubing pipe that contains uh, uh, coolant that uh, between each of the indoor units and the outdoor units. So heat pumps are great because they don't create heat or destroy heat, they just move it around. And as a result, they use one fourth the energy as a natural gas advantageous. Now for water heating, it's similar. I have a heat pump water heater that runs on electricity and the air source heat pump also runs on electricity. And this is just like a gas water heater, except that there's no gas. And so it runs on electricity and it exchanges heat with the air inside this mechanical room. So the room itself gets a little bit cooler 
during the day, which is fine during the summer because then I open the door to the room and let some of that cool air out. But the temperature does not get really cold. It's just a few degrees cooler. And again, it's very efficient. It uses one fourth the energy as a natural gas heater. And it doesn't require pipes, except, I mean, it doesn't require natural gas pipes. It just requires water pipes. Um, so very efficient and works really well. Uh, for cooking, I use an electric induction cooktop. Uh, this is actually not the same as electric resistance. Most people do not like the electric resistance stoves, but the electric induction cooktop is much better. It boils water in half the time as natural gas. Um, when you touch the stove, it does, even when you're boiling water, it does not feel hot. It's just warm because you're not producing heat in the stove. Uh, what's going on is you're exciting molecules in the bottom of the pot or the pan. And so the base of the pot or the pan has to either be iron or stainless steel, uh, which has high resistance because you basically create resistance uh, with electricity currents. You create resistance in the pot or the pan so the pot or the pan gets hot and that cooks the food very evenly, uh, whereas the stove itself does not get hot. So it works really well. And I show an indi individual burner on the left now that burner costs on the order of $60, could be even down to $40. And I show that because as I mentioned earlier in developing countries, a lot of people cook with wood or dung or biomass, other type of biomass or coal causing lots of air pollution, health problems and death. And we can replace all that type of cooking with a single burner, as I mentioned, that runs on electricity and as it's very inexpensive. Now you need an electricity source, of course. And so that's where having a few solar panels or community solar uh, will really help having some batteries, creating microgrids in remote communities is a way to solve this problem, the air pollution and energy problems uh, associated with burning things. Um, this shows results of four years of, of energy use in my home. Uh, and actually I'm finished now almost five years and this, I have even better results this year. Uh, but over the four years, I generated 120% of all my home and vehicle energy uh, from the solar on the roof. So I have two electric cars as well. I've had no electric bill, natural gas bill, or gasoline bill during this period. <clears throat> For the extra solar electricity, I sold it to a community choice aggregation utility. These are utilities that are available in California and several other states <clears throat> that will not only provide you with 100% renewable electricity if you do not have your own solar, but will also purchase extra solar um, from you at the cost that they would uh, charge you if you were using that solar. <clears throat> now, I avoided not only do I get paid for the extra electricity and do I not have any bills, but I also avoided during construction, the need for gas pipe. In my case, it would have saved about 10, to $12,000, but I show a range here, a few to $15,000, depending on the size of your house. There's a gas hookup fee that it was avoided. It was about $6,000. Then I have the savings of all those electric and natural gas and vehicle fuel bills. So a total of five to $23,000 up front for your average home, plus another three to $10,000 per year. And then there are subsidies available in many places. With subsidies, the payback time is five years. Without, it's about 10 years. And, but the solar is warrantied for 25 years. So this is really, a uh, everybody should be doing this. Uh, it's so much, it's so efficient to use electric appliances these days. And this shows an example. So on the hottest day of the year in 2020, the outside temperature, and sorry that I'm using Fahrenheit here, but everything here is in Fahrenheit. Uh, the outside temperature was 106 degrees on the hottest day of the year. I kept the inside temperature 55, sorry, 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see on the right that the green was my solar production that day. The blue was during the day was the electricity production from solar that was used for um, home use. Most of that was for the heat pumps to keep the house cool. But you can see it's not using a whole lot of electricity to keep the temperature 30 degrees Fahrenheit below the outside temperature. The nighttime blue is from the batteries, and then the red is when I needed grid electricity. But you can see from the data here that on that day, over the 24 hours, I generated 12 kilowatt hours more than I consumed. So on the hottest day of the year, I'm actually a net producer of electricity while keeping the home perfectly comfortable. 
if everybody were doing this, there would be no blackouts in the state. This is a time of year when blackouts will occur. Okay, so next step is to look at, can we transition, actually I should have said Italy in the world, to 100% uh, clean renewable energy for all purposes. And so I'm gonna talk about new roadmaps we've developed for 145 countries, including Italy. And this shows for all 145 countries, the 2018 end use power demand was about 13.1 trillion watts or terawatts. That's expected to go up in a business as usual case to 20.4 terawatts uh, by 2050. But if we electrify all energy and provide the electricity with wind, water, and solar, the energy requirements go down about 56%. And you might ask, how does that occur? And this is without people changing their habits. Well, it's because battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are more efficient than internal combustion engine vehicles. Like an individual battery electric vehicle uses about one fourth the energy as an internal combustion engine vehicle. Hydrogen fuel cell is not quite so efficient. Um, except when you get to long distance heavy transport, then it actually becomes more efficient than battery, battery electrics. But overall, uh, all types of transportation, there's a 20.5% reduction of energy use uh, compared with business as usual. There's another 4.3% reduction of energy requirements due to electrifying industry, 13.6% due to the efficiency of heat pumps for heating and cooling versus uh, natural gas heaters and oil-based heaters. And then 11% of all energy worldwide is used to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels and uranium. And that's eliminated. And then we get another 6.6% due to energy efficiency improvements beyond what's expected in business as usual. So that adds up to 56.4%. So this is another way of looking at that. Uh, this goes from 2020 to 2050 on the horizontal axis. And if we do not do anything, we go along the very top line to the business as usual on the business as usual trajectory. But then if we electrify all energy, provide the electricity with wind, water, solar, we go down those five shades of colors down to the 100% WWS line. So each of those reductions represents the number I showed in the last uh, table. And then we'll provide that wind, water, solar with certain percentage of onshore and offshore wind, uh, utility PV, CSP, solar heat, rooftop PV, geothermal heat and electricity, hydroelectric and tidal wave. And this shows the average over, or the, well, yeah, the average over all 145 countries. Now this is if we transition by 2050, 100% with 80% by 2030, this is kind of what a transition line would like, be, like, be like. But we really need to transition even faster. Well, if we do this transition line, this will, according to IPCC, will avoid 1.5 degrees warming. The key is, you know, to get 80% transition by 2030, well, that's eight years away. <clears throat> and so that's a rapid, we would need to rapidly transition all energy sectors and eliminate all non-energy emissions simultaneously. So that's a big asking, but it's possible. So along this trajectory, we can avoid 1.5 degrees if we do this. Um, we can even do it faster. This is, shows the same result, but 80% transition by 2030 and 100% by 2035 across all energy sectors. The endpoints in 2050 is still the same, uh, but this shows a faster transition. So somewhere in between is hopefully, I mean, if we can get 80% by 2030, that would be awesome, um, but that's what we should shoot for. That's the minimum we should shoot for, I believe. And we should also shoot for 100% by 2035 uh, if possible. Doesn't mean we will actually get there, but if we don't try, we definitely won't get there. Now, if we look at the worldwide, if I average over the, 100, uh, the 145 countries, the, the, pr the production of the energy would be about, and this, this is just one set of scenarios, worldwide about 32% onshore wind, 13% offshore, 16% rooftop PV, 30% utility PV, Three, less than 3% CSP, less than 1% geothermal electricity, almost 5% hydro, all of which exists, and then tiny amounts of tidal wave and some geothermal heat and solar heat. For Italy, there's a little more onshore wind and offshore wind um, and some rooftop and utility PV, CSP. You can see the numbers. Again, this is just one scenario, 
that uh, results in a stable grid in Italy. But you can imagine there are other scenarios with maybe less onshore wind, more solar or utility PV. Um, and so a lot of the, the limits are, you know, you might ask, why isn't there more utility PV? Well, it's just because we're trying to limit the land area required. Uh, and so more you, if it's more rooftop PV, that would be great. That doesn't take up new land, but more utility PV will take up more land. We want to keep the land requirements under a few percent. So I'll show you, I'll show you that in a minute. But uh, yeah, so here, in fact, is the land requirements. Worldwide, well, offshore wind does not take up new land. Tidal wave do not take up new land. We're, this, is, this shows new land required uh, in addition to what's already being taken up by renewables. Um, hydro, we in our plans, we have no new hydro added. Now, it's not that we, we don't object to new hydro, but we're assuming that there won't be new hydro uh, in the average. Uh, so there's no new land for that. Rooftop PV does not take up new land. There's not a whole lot of geothermal. So the new land is basically utility PV plus CSP and onshore wind. And on a worldwide scale, that land area required for the onshore wind is about 0.36% of all world land area. And for utility PV and CSP, that's called footprint on the ground, that's about 0.17%. So for onshore wind, that is spacing in between wind turbines which is open space that can be used for multiple purposes. That's why they're separated out. The onshore wind land is mostly open space that has dual purpose. The utility PV and CSP is pretty much footprint that you can't use for other purposes. However, you can put some of that PV in between wind turbines so that some of that 0.36% can be occupied by the utility PV plus CSP land. So this 0.53% total is the maximum and most of that land actually has multiple purposes. Now for Italy, you can see the numbers are a bit higher. Um, onshore wind is close to 2% and utility PV plus CSP is 0.24%. So we could reduce onshore wind, increase utility PV. Um, as I said, there are multiple ways to do this. This was just one scenario uh, for Italy. And this is an example of keeping the grid stable. So we, we broke up those 145 countries into 24 world regions. And so Italy was in the Europe region. I could have showed Europe here. But um, uh, then we looked at matching supply demands, well, matching demand for electricity and heat for all purposes with generation storage demand response uh, every 30 seconds. So this is a very high resolution and time model. Uh, so every 30 seconds here for two years. And this shows that we can match demand every 30 seconds. And the, the, on the bottom, it shows, well, both of these graphs show the results every hour, but we didn't do it down to 30 second resolution. But you can see we're matching demand with supply storage and demand response uh, exactly every 30 seconds for two years everywhere in the world without any blackouts whatsoever. And this is using meteorological data for the wind and solar from a climate model. So it's, it's predicting the wind and solar radiation uh, every 30 seconds for two years everywhere in the world. Now, you might ask, well, what's the cost of energy? And these are the costs basically of a Green New Deal, either worldwide or in a given country. So in terms of the cost per unit electricity product produced or, or heat produced, it's on the order of 8.3 cents per kilowatt hour worldwide. US is about 8.7 cents, China is about 7.6 cents, Italy was about 8.4 cents a kilowatt hour. And you can, whoops, you can see the, the capital costs also 61.5 trillion for the world, about 7 trillion for the US, 13 trillion for China is on the order of 6 trillion for Europe, and 545 billion for Italy. So that's what it costs to transition everything for all purposes to eliminate air pollution to eliminate this 7 million air pollution deaths per year, to eliminate emissions associated with global warming from energy, and to provide energy security for all these places. Now, this is another way to look at the costs, uh, which are the annual costs of energy. So worldwide in 2050, the annual fuel cost is going to be about $17.8 trillion per year. Today, it's on the order of $12 trillion per year. But the health cost is $33.6 trillion per year. That's the 7 million deaths plus hundreds of millions more illnesses per year from uh, business as usual combustion, uh, particles, and gases. And then the climate cost is about $32 trillion per year. So a total of $83 trillion per year is the social cost of fossil fuel energy. 
we eliminate with wind, water, solar, we eliminate the health costs, we eliminate the climate costs, we reduce the energy requirements 56%, but then we reduce the cost per unit energy another 10%. So that gives us a 63% lower energy cost down to 6.6 .6 trillion per year from 17.8 and a social cost reduction of 92%. So that's really the benefit of transitioning to 100% clean renewable energy, eliminating health costs, climate costs, and substantially reducing energy costs and providing energy stability, eliminating the these four energy insecurity issues that I mentioned before. Now, just a little bit on policies. Um, so we started developing these 100% renewable energy plans back in 2009 uh, with the, actually this paper, which was looking at can we power the world with just 100% wind, water, and solar. And that was really, it wasn't looking at grid stability uh, each, I mean, didn't have a didn't do the modeling, did some some analysis for good stability, but just looking at the annual average. And the conclusion of this study back then was yes, it's technically and economically possible in terms of resources, in terms of costs, in terms of um, uh, the land areas available for renewables, and in terms of materials. Uh, it's technically and economically possible to transition to 100% renewables worldwide by 2030, but for social and political reasons, that's more, not likely to happen. It's more practical to think of, you know, an 80% transition by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Little did we know that this would be the basis for the Green New Deal proposals in, US, in the U.S. to go to 100% renewables by 2030. Um, that have and they've made their way into other countries as well. But since then, there are 61 countries have committed, either through laws or other types of commitments, to 100% renewable electricity. However, only one country, Denmark, has committed to 100% renewable energy for all energy. So all these other countries have not um, committed for the transportation, buildings, industry. And most of these are small countries. Um, you know, big countries of the world have not committed as well. But there is progress. Um, there are 13 countries that are actually near or above 100% renewable electricity uh, production in their annual average. Uh, most of these produce mostly or generate mostly hydro. So Iceland, Norway, Costa Rica, Paraguay, Uruguay, Tajikistan, Albania, uh, and Bhutan, Nepal, Ethiopia, and the Congo all generate most of their electricity from, the, from hydro. Scotland is mostly wind. Kenya is mostly geothermal. But the good news is there are many countries that are either very close or over 100% renewable electricity in their annual average. And this is encouraging, although you know, there we need the bigger countries because I mean, the emissions alone from China are equivalent to the emissions of 120 countries that have low emissions. So uh, you know, one China is going to you know, take care of 120 countries worth of emissions if we can transition. Now, in the US, there are actually 18 states and territories that have laws or executive orders to go to 100% renewables. And these include Rhode Island by 2030, Washington, DC by 2032, Connecticut and Oregon by 2040, and most of them Hawaii, California, New Mexico, Washington State, New York, and Illinois by 2045, then Puerto Rico, Nevada, Maine, Wisconsin, Virginia, New Jersey, New North Carolina, and Nebraska by 2050. So that's great news that there are a lot of commitments, but again, this is just electricity, not all energy, and it's not all states. There are 180 US cities, including most of the major cities in the United States that have committed to 100% renewables. Worldwide, there are over 400 cities that have committed. And so it's really, that's the first step is to have a commitment, and then they actually have to do that. Uh, there are 300, now even more, but 340 companies at least that have committed to 100% renewables, including eight of the 10 biggest companies in the world, <coughs> which are in blue there. And this is important because these companies are actually purchasing wind farms and solar farms and building them uh, to offset their, their operations. So these are actual real renewable projects that are going up. Uh, and so we see a lot of growth of renewables in many countries and worldwide. In fact, there's a new study saying that 10% of all world electricity uh, as of this year is produced from just wind and solar alone. And that's for the first time. 
So there's this big growth of, of renewables, particularly wind and solar in many countries. And a lot of that growth is driven by companies that are purchasing uh, solar or wind farms to offset their energy use. Now, okay, so to summarize, I didn't talk about jobs, but I'll just mention them briefly here. We did analyze jobs in all 145 countries, and we found that we would create 28 million more long-term full-time jobs than lost by transitioning. These are a combination of construction jobs and permanent operation jobs. Uh, keep in mind, let's say we're continuously, let's say a, a wind turbine lasts 30 years, and just simplistically, let's say we develop one thirtieth of all the you know, wind farms we need every year for 30 years, well, we'd create 30 years worth of jobs, but then after 30 years, we'd start to have to replace you know, wind farms with new, new ones or refurbish them. And so we'd have continuous jobs after that. So this whole infrastructure will create jobs for a long time and more jobs than are lost. As I mentioned, we'd require only 0.17% of all land for footprint, and that's for the solar, uh, and only 0.36% for spacing worldwide. Now, in comparison, in the United States, one in three percent of all US land area is occupied by the fossil fuel industry. That's for millions of miles of oil and gas pipelines. Uh, that's, there are 1.3 million active oil and gas wells. There are 3.2 million abandoned wells. There are hundreds of thousands of gas stations. There are refineries, there are storage facilities, there are coal mines. Uh, all the fossil fuel industry takes up 1.3% of land. In the US, the land area required for wind, water, solar is less than 1% of the land, including lots of spacing. So we'd actually reduce land use. And another thing people are worried about are materials and in mining. Sure, we'll have to mine for lithium. We'll have to mine for neodymium and the other. And we'll need a lot of steel and concrete. But the we're reducing the mining substantially by going to clean renewable energy because with fossil fuels, you need to not only mine materials for the infrastructure, but also you have to mine for the fossil fuels themselves continuously forever. And so with renewables, the wind comes right to the turbine, the solar comes right to the panel. So we do not need to mine for the fuels, only for the infrastructure. So we have orders of magnitude less mining. Doesn't mean we eliminate mining, but we have much, much less mining. In the US, well, in North America, there are 50,000 new oil and gas wells drilled every year. And that, as I mentioned, takes up a huge amount of land area in, when you add it all up. And so we eliminate all that mining and replace it with some mining, but much less mining of, for raw materials. Um, we, well, the other conclusion here, we'd eliminate 7 million air pollution deaths per year uh, from energy, slow than reverse global warming. Uh, we keep the grid stable throughout the world with 100% clean renewable energy. We, we reduce absolute energy costs by 63% worldwide and health plus climate plus energy costs by 92%. And if you are interested in more information on this, uh, then here are some links and including the book that was mentioned earlier um, that really describes everything that I've been talking about and plus a lot more, and even discusses all the energy plans. Um, and yeah, and I also, I update a lot of stuff on Twitter, uh, all the more recent information. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, but thank you so much for listening. So. We'd like to thank the lecture. And now, as I, as I said before, uh, Everyone is invited to put questions uh, in the chat, and in, from this room, we will start uh, with uh, with a question for you. So I just uh, ask uh, Francesco Suman to start with this. Will you let me know? Okay, C can you hear me, Mark? I am, uh, yeah, I'm here uh, in the room. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, so, um, very um, interesting question. Well, that, uh, yeah, I think please. you might be muted. OK, you cannot hear me from the uh, so environmental um, audio? Uh, 
Uh, okay, maybe I'll come closer to the. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can okay. Hear. Better. Uh, well, so I invite people in the room who uh, want to ask some questions to Professor Jacobson to come closer to the microphone in order to, you know, be audible. Instead, I uh, suggest uh, people from the audience connected via Zoom, uh, they can type uh, their questions in the chat box. Alternatively, they can raise their hands with their raise your hand tool in Zoom, and we can unmute you, and so you can uh, speak and uh, ask your questions directly to Mark. So, uh, if there are already some questions from the audience, uh, both from the room or from the uh, Zoom platform, uh, you can uh, you are invited to uh, raise your hand. In the meantime, to break the ice, I can uh, ask a, a question to you directly, Mark. Um, it will be a, a, let's say let's start with a less technical question. Maybe there will be others uh, in the uh, discussion. Um, let's say it, it's something connected to recent events, you know, uh, ongoing in the world uh, recently. Uh, but first, I will start asking you if uh, um, you are happy with the ongoing climate policies in your country, in the U.S. I mean, as Joe Biden uh, kept his promises on clean energy spending, uh, how is the climate bill going? Because I. I know there were some problems in the Congress there, and maybe things didn't went how uh, you expected. Can you tell us something about that? Yes. Um, well, certainly it's better than it was a couple of years ago, uh, but I'm still I'm not totally pleased because many years ago with President Obama, there was a policy called All of the Above, where you just try a little bit of everything and hope it works. And that has actually just been adopted again. So uh, President Biden and his cabinet or his energy advisors are really proposing to use a lot of technologies that we do not think are very helpful. So we do not, like, I'm focused on wind, water, and solar, so clean renewable energy, eliminating combustion. But there are many who push carbon capture, direct air capture, biofuels, biomass, bio, energy and nuclear. So all of these, you know, the bio, the, all of those, or most of those are combustion. So when you use carbon capture, you're burning fossil fuels and then you try to capture the CO2. But all the other air pollutants go right to the air and you have more of those air pollutants because you need more energy and so you burn more fossils to get that energy. So for example, there was one, car there was one carbon capture plant attached coal plant into the U.S. starting in 2016. It was in Texas, they had a coal plant and they added carbon capture. But to run the carbon capture equipment, they had to build a natural gas plant just to provide the electricity to run the carbon capture for the coal plant. That increased the energy use overall by 25 to 50 percent. And there was more natural gas mining to provide the energy. None of CO2 from a natural gas plant was captured. And the efficiency of the capture was only 70% from the coal plant, but it did not capture any CO2 from the upstream mining of the coal or the natural gas or the natural gas mining. And this is before you look at what happened to the CO2 after it was captured. So when you actually added up all the numbers, only 11% of the CO2 emitted from this whole system was ever captured. Of that, it was all sent to a nearby oil field to enhance oil recovery. That resulted in 40% of that CO2 that was captured going right back to the air, and then more oil, which is also burned more air pollution. So what happens with carbon capture? You have more air pollution, more mining, more fossil infrastructure, hardly any CO2 benefit. So it's a big smoke stream. Same thing with direct air capture, the same thing with blue hydrogen. And when you're burning uh, bioenergy, biomass, biofuels, you're producing air pollution. You're not reducing much carbon. Problems with nuclear, of course, are it takes 17 to 20 years these days between planning and operation of a nuclear plant. There's one in 
There's only one being built in the U.S. In Georgia is on year 17. It's 33 billion dollars in. It's supposed to cost 11 billion dollars. It's on the order of now seven or eight times per kilowatt hour of wind and solar, which can go up in one or two years. It has weapons proliferation, meltdown risks, etc. So this is what the Biden administration is proposing: more nuclear, more bioenergy, more carbon capture, more direct air capture. I mean, they're also doing a lot of renewables too, so I don't want to totally uh, say it's bad. There's a lot of renewables, but they're also putting money into these other things that are not useful at all. Okay, great. Thank you very much uh, for your answer. Uh, in the meantime, we have some questions uh, in the uh, uh, I can't hear you. Chat you box, but maybe we have uh, uh, Alessandro Massi Favan who wants to ask you a question. Uh, I think uh, we can unmute him so we can, we can let him speak. Uh, please. Yes. Yes. Please un unmute uh, Alessandro, please. I think, I think Alessandro is already connected. Yes, but he is not unmuted yet. Please try again. Okay. Alessandro. Okay. Yes, please, Alessandro. Yes. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Youngstone. And uh, thank you very much also to the University of Padua, to Dr. Bartuko for organizing this. Uh, really, really great uh, uh, seminar. And uh, so thanks also from the Interdepartmental Center, Jack Machamps from the University of Gates, who work on energy transportation and, uh, and the climate change. And uh, I was reading your book, and I found a really brilliant the solution that you proposed in order to solve the problems that we have in the world today. And uh, moreover, I found uh, many of the answers to several of the questions that commonly arise in the mind of skeptics. And there are really many. But something that I, I could not find, but you already mentioned a little bit about it, I would like uh, to ask your opinion, uh, if you can uh, uh, deepen your opinion on this, is the role of critical minerals in the transition to renewable, and especially with reference to the energy storage. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> well, it's interesting, with, I'll talk, focus on lithium for a minute because um, we'll need a lot of batteries and you need lithium for, for a lot of good batteries. There are many alternatives, of course, to lithium for batteries. Um, there's sulfur batteries, there's iron air batteries. But anyway, with lithium, well, first of all, when we change the energy infrastructure, we're changing the industry energy infrastructure too. So all the mining itself will be renewable in the end. So no emissions from the mining itself. Now, in terms of lithium, there's actually ways to extract lithium that result that requires zero mining, new mining. For example, the Salton Sea in California, uh, there have been surveys that that may be there may be enough lithium in the Salton Sea alone to power the entire United States, provide enough batteries for the entire U.S. For example, maybe even much of the world, and they can extract that with no new mining. The reason is is there's already geothermal electricity being produced in the Salton Sea. There's actually a place in Germany as well where you have the same situation. And when you're doing geothermal electricity, you're already bringing up a brine that contains lithium. And so that fluid that already contains this lithium, you can extract the lithium from the fluid without any additional mining. So that's one way, that's a second way to make it the process cleaner and reduce mining is combining lithium extraction with geothermal electricity production. Now you will need um, there will be cases where you do need new mining, and but as I mentioned, it's orders of magnitude less. There was a study recently that looked at that very issue of looking at a fossil fuel energy infrastructure versus a renewable energy infrastructure. And the people who claim that, oh, you need a lot of mining and that's going to cause a lot of damage with renewables, they almost always ignore the fact that you have continuous fuel mining with fossil fuels. In fact, I had to write an opinion editorial recently addressing a climate skeptic who was claiming that fossil fuel mining is less than renewable mining, but they totally ignored the fact they were just talking about the infrastructure. They were ignoring the fuel extraction. So there was a recent study that found that you over a lifetime, over 20, well, over 20 years, uh, mining for a renewable infrastructure in Texas would result in, they had some number like 20 million fewer tons of, of earth move compared to a fossil fuel infrastructure. So this is, yeah, you're not going to get rid of mining. We can make it cleaner, have better practices. 
but it will be a lot less mining than with uh, fossil fuels. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, so there are a couple of questions from the chat box. Uh, the first one comes from Lorenzo Fattelli. Now, let's see if we can unmute uh, Lorenzo so that he can uh, directly ask his question to you. Otherwise, uh, I can uh, uh, read it, but... Yes. Lorenzo, please, are you there? Yes, please, uh, go ahead. All right, well. Yeah, I'll say, okay, so thank you for, uh, for the talk. And my question was uh, somehow related because I would like to, to learn a bit more about what uh, uh, potentially what alternatives are there uh, to batteries and if these are viable or realistic, if they can provide uh, uh, a viable energy density storage, let's say. And in particular, you mentioned at the beginning um, compressed air, uh, I think liquefied air as well. Uh, with that, I think we could, of course, this can be then used to generate electricity again and also cooling. And, uh, this was my my thought you know because as as it as it expands i think that it should also cool down itself you no know? so this could be a, a combined beneficial effects for instance during during summer during when when the the cooling needs are, are highest you're correct yeah well there are these many options and it will deter, the market will determine which ones are going to be the most efficient in terms of the costs. Um, but I should say that you know the most common type of electricity storage today is, aside from hydroelectric dams, which are basically big batteries, is pumped hydro. And pumped hydro is the largest. And then you know, batteries are growing. But, and then, as I mentioned, there are many different types of batteries, uh, not just the lithium. But yeah, compressed air is another option. I would say it's going to fill a niche. I don't think it's going to be large. I mean, you can. One of the ideas for compressed air is when you have a wind turbine, you can actually have a small storage container nearby so that you know when you have extra electricity you can then compress the air and then you can then when you need the electricity you can expand it and so they're local sites so the the compressed air storage like under underground in caverns you know that's not going to be very large because there are only a few places that you can do that effectively so it's more likely for compressed air you might have these storage containers um, and if you know it's great if it works if it's economically competitive that would be great um, i'm guessing it'll be probably a niche uh, maybe same with the liquid storage but who knows you know some one of these technologies may the cost may just be so low that it'll take off i mean batteries are nice because they're simple you can put them pretty much anywhere and the costs are coming down we well if they if the cost of battery systems get to less than 60 dollars per kilowatt hour of storage I think the game is over. I think we just we can go forever with that with less than sixty dollars a kilowatt hour. Right now, it's it's on the order of one hundred to one hundred fifty or so per kilowatt hour. But it's estimated that by 2030, 2035, if not sooner, it'll be down to sixty. And, and so that would make it um, very easy to provide one hundred percent renewables everywhere. But if one of these other technologies like compressed air or gravitational storage, where you lift concrete blocks. When you have extra electricity and you lower them when you need electricity, um, if those come down in cost, that's great. Um, we support all of those, but I, I can't say which one is going to win out right now. Great. Um, next question comes from uh, uh, Julio Buja. We have already mm -hmm. a couple of more questions. Everybody's muted again. <laughs> can you can you hear me? Can you hear me from the maybe? Um, Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening to everybody and thank you for uh, uh, the conference. Um, I also wanted to ask something about energy storage. Uh, I come to understand uh, uh, this um, scenario will need a lot of energy storage. And uh, from some researches I did, um, I found out there is no uh, a very competitive um, type of bulk storage. The only um, very versatile and uh, efficient energy storage we have is uh, batteries. Um, for example, uh, particularly lithium batteries, which can work uh, on um, on um, vehicles and and so on. However, uh, I think we should consider also the 
mm, the strategic materials we need to make uh, these batteries very efficient. And I'm thinking about uh, um, the mines in Congo, which is the, mm, I think it's almost the only place where we can find uh, uh, cobalt for lithium batteries. And I wanted to ask uh, if you consider these, uh, um, these needs uh, in your articles. And also, I appreciated the um, taking into consideration of um, the social gain in, uh, in the transition. Uh, however, I wanted to ask if you considered also uh, the loss of jobs, which could result, for example, for the uh, cut in use of uh, uh, traditional energy sources and uh, the commissioning cost of uh, um, power plants, which are already in operations. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, yeah, with regard to materials, yeah, we've kind of discussed that, but in terms of cobalt specifically in the Congo, um, well, we definitely want to institute good practices. Um, so we, we will need cobalt. Um, there, I think there are also alternatives. There are other ways that we're gonna have, we'll have batteries that might minimize the use of cobalt. Um, but in, the, in a place like the Congo, we need to institute better practices. But I don't think, you know, we're gonna have to do something, we're, we're going to need a transition. This is, so we cannot say, well, we're not going to mine cobalt in the Congo because of um, their, you know, because the practices aren't good now, we just have to improve them. So we'll have to find a way to make it work. That's the bottom line, because otherwise we can't transition um, unless we include storage. We'll have, if not, we'll have to go to other types of storage. So those are the alternatives, either go to other types of battery storage for cars, for example, or find a way to make the current mining practices better. Um, so I don't have an answer to what's the best way to improve the conditions. Um, I can just say that that's what we need to focus on, and but we will need these materials. And I have a feeling, you know, we can find cobalt other places as well. Um, it's just that that's where most of it's being mined right now. But again, overall, the number, the amount of mining of everything will be orders of magnitude less. So that cannot be used as a reason for not going forward with this, um, because if we don't do this transition, we're stuck with far more mining millions of air pollution deaths per year, which um, we can't, is not acceptable. And, and then global warming, which is causing horrific problems. So there is no choice but to move forward. So we just have to find a way rather than argue that, well, we shouldn't do it. Um, so we have to just find a way to do it better. And with regard to jobs, yeah, there are gonna be job losses in some industries. We do find more job creation in other places. So like a place like West Virginia in the US where it's mostly coal mining, uh, they're already starting to train. In fact, that's part of the good, one of the good things that President Biden has done is actually a job training, retraining uh, for, for example, coal miners or oil workers. Um, so we will need to do that. There will be some tough times for some people, um, but in the end, there will be an improvement for more people. And so again, we need to focus on you know, the overall picture and um, and try to make it, you know, try to have uh, a safety gap or safety measures for those who lose their jobs um, to make sure that they don't fall too far behind and then they can be retrained also for newer jobs. Um, so it's, it's, it's not, nothing is going to be easy, but again, we need to march forward because otherwise it's, if we don't march forward, we're really, Going to have more worse. We're going to have worse consequences than if we try to march forward. But thank you again. That's a really good question. Thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, so next in line is uh, Giovanni. I think we can uh, unmute you so that we can uh, directly ask your question. Uh, let's see if Giovanni is still there. Uh, one minute, please. Let's just, there you go. Okay. Giovanni, please go on. Giovanni, please. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Thank yes. you. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, Mark. Congratulations Hello. for the, the whole 
work that I guess there is behind uh, all this data you are bringing, uh, bringing to us. And um, what about uh, uh, offsetting? <clears throat> because we surely will not be able to meet the UN goals of 50% uh, emission less uh, within, uh, let's say, 1930 and 100% within 1950. <clears throat> so the, the offsetting, uh, it, will, uh, it will be a very important, uh, let's say offsetting, I mean, uh, the compensation of uh, CO2 reduction, right? Uh, definitely, I agree with you that uh, the, the, the capturing, uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's very difficult and very expensive, but let's not forget that we have up there in the atmosphere already something like 1,000 uh, gigatons uh, that are the actual cause of the climate change already. So we will have to capture somehow those, uh, those tons, right? Uh, what do you think? Um, so, well, you mentioned we we might not get fifty percent renewables, let's say by twenty thirty, but if we if we want to use direct air capture, well, first of all, I do support natural direct air capture, like growing trees, reducing deforestation, you know, better carbon practices for land. So, natural methods I'm fine with, but if you want to use direct air capture, you need energy, right? And even if that energy is renewable, let's say it's coming from wind, well, that wind, if you're not using it for, the re for direct air capture, what would you be using it for? You would be using it to replace a coal plant or a gas plant. So if you use wind to replace a coal plant, you not only eliminate carbon dioxide from the coal plant, but you eliminate the air pollution from the coal plant and you eliminate the mining of the coal and you eliminate the coal infrastructure. Whereas if you use that electricity just for direct air capture, all you're doing is reducing some CO2, not reducing air pollution, not reducing mining, not reducing infrastructure. So the social cost benefit of using that wind is, is going to be far higher. In fact, it's 10 times higher to replace a coal plant than to run direct air capture. So it okay. actually makes it more difficult to solve the problem. The reason we won't get, I mean, if we, have, if we ha can't get more than 50% renewables on the grid and we use and if that's because we're using the renewables for direct air capture, that means we're actually slowing ourselves down because you actually get more CO2 reduction by taking that same wind to replace coal than you do to direct air capture because direct air capture is not really efficient either. And so it's an opportunity cost. And so actually we've, we've looked at this and there's actually no case where it's better to use direct air capture than to just re take renewables and replace fossil fuels with them. Okay. Always better to do that. Even if you get to... 100% renewables and zero fossil fuels, then the question is, well, should we spend money and use energy for direct air capture or should we reduce deforestation, reduce methane from landfills, from rice paddies, reduce CFC emi or um, halogen emissions, reduce nitrous, nitrous oxide. These are other low hanging fruit that's actually easier to do than direct air capture. Direct air capture is really another reason for the fossil fuel industry to stay in business because they just say, let's offset. And so we can keep running our coal plant or gas plant because we're offsetting with direct air capture. I think you're still Thank here. You. Thank you. Uh, now it's Andrius Gedrimas turn. I hope the pronunciation is correct. We are going to unmute Andrius in a second. And then uh, you can ask your question directly to Mark. Andrius, are you there? Can you hear us? Oh, okay. Well, alternatively, I can read Andrew's question if Andrew is not able to uh, speak directly. Can you hear me, Mark? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, Andrew says, great presentation. I wanted to ask Professor Jacobson in regards to, Oops, in regards to, can you hear me? Sorry. Okay, sorry. There again. Uh, so I want to ask uh, Professor Jacobson in regards to solution for weeks without wind, 
Is it really the hydrogen solution for maritime industry long haul transportation? Is also the hydrogen practically of storage space, etc.? This is the question. Yeah, well, when you have weeks without wind, so we we looked at, as I mentioned, intermittency of wind and solar uh, in 145 countries broken into 24 world regions and looking every 30 seconds. And so it's really, if you don't have wind, you need, a com it's a combination of solar storage, some geothermal, um, hy hydroelectric. So it's, it's really a combination. We found that even, well, first of all, if you have weeks without wind in one place, you don't have it without, I mean, there is wind, there's always wind somewhere in the world. Now on a continental scale, uh, there's also always wind, even though it's, it's not zero, even if, so you don't have weeks totally without wind, you might have weeks with low amounts of wind. But we found, in fact, we did a study for Europe where I looked at individual countries keeping the grid 100% renewable and stable in each of the individual countries of Western Europe, like even down to um, uh, Luxembourg. I mean, we were able to keep 100% renewables continuously in Luxembourg, uh, which is a tiny country powering itself, but also in Spain, France, you know, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands, UK, et cetera. And then we looked at combining them, interconnecting them. So it's always cheaper to interconnect countries, but you can also keep the grid stable in individual countries because it's a combination of wind, solar, geothermal, hydroelectric, tidal wave, and also storage. And this is why these ba the battery storage really helps to do that. You can get a week of battery storage just by concatenating four hour batteries together. And so, and you also have big hydro dams. I mean, especially, you know, Norway is like a big battery because it has so much hydro. Switzerland also has a lot of hydro. Um, so by combining these places with hydro with a battery storage and uh, combining with solar and wind, you know, if the wind's not blowing, often the sun is shining. Well, sometimes though you don't have either, and that's where the storage comes into play. So you have to size the storage to make sure you don't have the power out. There's always some size of storage. Then it comes to a question, okay, what's the cost of the storage? So that's when, if the cost is less than $60 a kilowatt hour, you can add huge amounts of storage, huge, without any problem. And you will you don't need much space for it. Um, and you can keep the grid stable. So that's the solution is, adding sufficient amount of battery storage together with the other types of storage, and you have heat storage and cold storage and district heating as well. Actually, the more district heating you have, the um, cheaper things are as well. So it's really a combination of all these factors. In terms of hydrogen, we, yeah, hydrogen for long distance marine for shipping, that's good for fuel cells. We're proposing using hydrogen only in fuel cells, not burning hydrogen. Um, but we did an analysis transitioning long distance ships, long distance aircraft, uh, military equipment, all sorts of tanks and armored vehicles to hydrogen versus electricity. And you know, electricity you can do for some, but you can do everything with hydrogen uh, in terms of practicality uh, based on published technologies. Uh, so yeah, for long distance ship and planes, we use hydrogen fuel cells. Thank you. So next question comes from Professor Massimo Guarnieri, and uh, he can uh, address the question directly from uh, uh, the room here. Maybe you can have the microphone here. Uh, the microphone is here at the camera, so let's see if we can see. There you go. This is Massimo Guarnieri. There, you can ask your question. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm Massimo Guarnieri from the University of Padova. I had a question about, uh, uh, again, uh, energy storage related to uh, grid uh, power quality and stability services. Uh, in order to provide stability, we need uh, fast response, fast uh, technologies. And uh, lithium ion actually is a good choice for, from this point of view. But uh, in, in the last month, uh, it is emerging the need for uh, also to provide not only so far response, but also uh, longer, uh, uh, long discharges, long duration, uh, in excess of a four hour, which is the typical limit uh, used for lithium ion. Uh, you, you, I think you do not uh, find any uh, lithium ion battery uh, that is rated for more than four hours. So uh, what can be, uh, for instance, uh, 
I know that uh, the Fraunhofer Institute for Chemical Technology is ready to publish a paper on uh, uh, a study, experimental study in Germany showing that uh, longer times are needed for the stability in the order of 10 hours or so. And I think uh, compressed there and pumped hydro are not suitable for this because they have not fast response. So do, do you have any, any analysis on this kind of demanding service, challenging services, which must be either fast in the response and longer in the duration? Thank you. Yeah, but, well, that's our recent study. We looked at concatenating batteries. So we have long duration battery storage just if you take four hour batteries and you put two together, you now have eight hours of storage. Put three together, you have 12 hours, et cetera. So just concatenating batteries creates long duration storage. That's the solution and it works. I mean, I have, because I do it, I've had it in my own garage. I have four batteries concatenated together. And so each is a two hour battery. It can give me eight hours of storage at the peak discharge rate of one battery, or it can give me two hours of storage at the peak discharge rate of four batteries or anything in between. So we already have long duration storage, so we don't need new technologies for eight. In fact, we don't want a 100 hour battery or, or a 20 hour battery. I, I'm not saying we don't want, I mean, the thing is you, you want the batteries both for the duration and the peak. And if you have just long duration storage with a low peak, that's not helpful for getting the peaks. And if you have just short duration with high peak, um, then that doesn't help either. But concatenating the batteries gives you both long duration and high peaking, and then you can do anything in between. So that's really the solution is just concatenating batteries. So we don't need a new technology in my opinion. Uh, you are muted. Okay, thank you, Professor Jacobson. Next question comes from Vanni Lugi. Um, I hope uh, we are going to be able to uh, unmute uh, Vanni Luki, if Vanni, are you there? Can you can you hear us? Okay. Otherwise, I can uh, read Vanni's question. I, I I can hear you, and I can okay. I can speak if you want. Perfect. We can yeah. So uh, thank you very much for your talk. Very enlightening. Very clear uh, with so many data. Um, so there's been a lot of talking about uh, the mining issue, and you have uh, said that, uh, and I agree with that, that uh, uh, mining, if we switch to renewable, is going to be reduced by orders of magnitude. Um, and yet, this is overall, but for specific materials, for uh, specific uh, critical materials, the mining is actually going to be increased by orders of magnitude itself, like one or two in the case of lithium, for example. Uh, so I guess I have a, I have a more a comment and, and I would, would like a, a comment from you too. Um, I think that switching to a, a very uh, hardcore circular economy on this type of material is gonna be key in order to uh, allow the, the energy transition to make this energy, energy transition possible. Uh, so I would like to, you to comment on, on this, on uh, the idea of recycling uh, these uh, critical materials. And uh, if you have looked into it and if you, if you think it's possible and to what extent in terms of both, uh, um, well, essentially in terms of uh, scalability uh, as of now. And the, and the other question is um, more general. What do you think uh, the uh, key bottleneck uh, is for the energy transition? Where do you think we should put all our money <laughs> right now? Right. Well, yeah, in terms of recycling, there are already companies that recycle 95 to 97% of the materials and batteries. So Redwood Materials is one. Um, J.B. Straubel, who's the one of the founders of Tesla, he, he quit Tesla and then started this uh, battery recycling company. And they already do this. They already recycle all the critical materials. And there are other companies actually that do it as well. So this is already happening. And so that's going to alleviate some of the mining needs, hopefully a lot, uh, because yeah, we'll need one time mining, but then that whatever that cobalt or lithium that is mined, it will go back into, into batteries, hopefully in other materials for hundreds of years um, before we need even new mining. So I think that will help a lot. And 
the um, sorry, what was your, your second question? What was that again? It was about the oh the bottlenecks. Yeah, bottlenecks. So yeah, the biggest bottleneck I see is this all of the above policy. Well, aside from education, most people are not aware of what's possible. And so I think there is this, you know, the fact that most people aren't aware, then they think that there's nothing, it's not possible to transition. They're skeptical about renewables as a result. So education, I think, is the number one bottleneck. The number two is that there are a lot of people pushing a lot of technologies that are not very helpful. And so that distracts from the solution. And it's like an opportunity cost, and it makes it harder to transition if we have so many competing solutions and money going to so many different things that are not going to be so helpful. So I think that's another um, bottleneck. In terms of practical things, transmission distribution is not going to be easy to add fast. It's not a technical problem, not even a cost problem. It's more of a zoning issue. So you'll probably end up, well, to, to keep the grid stable, you either need a lot of transmission distribution or a lot of storage or a mixture of the two. I think storage is going to win out in the end mostly because it's hard to put up a huge amount of transmission distribution, new, new transmission, especially long distance transmission. So that could be a, a something that slows things down because it would be nice to have a good mix of both transmission distribution and uh, storage. Thank you very much. I think we are approaching uh, our deadline, uh, four o'clock uh, Italian time. So we will take one last question from Enrico Nobile. Um, we are going to unmute Enrico. Uh, can you hear us, Enrico? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. I would like to thank the organizer and particularly I'd like to thank Professor Jackson, Jacobson for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I know that uh, my question might not be very popular here. I'm talking about nuclear energy. Uh, I know and I agree on the fact that nuclear energy might not be considered as a possible renewable energy source alternative for different reason, nuclear waste, safety, proliferation risk, et cetera, and so forth and so on. However, there have been a, a fair amount of claims about the forthcoming uh, compact standardized uh, uh, small nuclear reactor. Uh, I think you heard about that. So I'm just wondering if you don't think that they might play a role, at least in the first phase of the energy transition, because of some of their advantages. They use a limited amount of land. Uh, they are intrinsically safe. Uh, they can use the, 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 the present grid infrastructure and so forth and so on. What is your opinion? Thank you very much. Well, before large nuclear reactors, there was actually a lot of development of small reactors. And the reason they were abandoned was because of economies of scale. So I think in terms of cost, they're going to find that they're the same or more expensive than the larger reactors. They're not being even being planned to be ready until like 2028, 29, 30, and everything in nuclear is always pushed back. So we need percent of the problem solved by 2030. And if we have a technology that won't even be ready by then, at a, that'll even be just a demonstration scale, it's not very helpful. And then it all, there's no evidence that it doesn't have all these other problems. I mean, some of the reactors are being touted because they use higher um, ref, uh, refined uranium, that's a higher refining um, percentage. But then you're closer to weapons grade uranium. And so and you have these small modular reactors, you can move around the world. So the weapons proliferation risk becomes even larger. Uh, whether there's a meltdown risk, we don't know. There's going to be, you just need as much uranium mining. Uh, and so the mining problem is still there. And the ones that claim that they don't need so much mining because they, uh, they use or they have um, higher concentrations of, re of refined uranium, in those cases, again, they're, we they're weapons grade, closer to weapons grade. So this is, there's really, I don't see any difference between these uh, types of proposed reactors and the large modular reactors, except that they're easier to spread around the world and create weapons problems. Uh, and the risk, you know, and the risk is unknown, especially when you have a bunch of different companies that have a bunch of different standards. Uh, we don't know what the risks are. So I would, and I think from estimates of cost, the costs are going to be similar. So, uh, you know, maybe they will be a little, take a little less time to put up 
because they're more modularized, but maybe not, you know, you just never know. So I would not, we have technologies today that we know work. And again, I think we should focus on what does work, keep our eye on the ball and try to solve as much problem, as much of the problem as possible with what we have. Costs are coming down for everything that's related to renewables, including batteries and wind and solar and uh, even geothermal and CSP and electric vehicles. But we should just focus on things that are we know are safe. Why take a, why focus on something that has so many risks associated with it and so many unknowns when we have technologies that do work? So that's I would say don't invest in that in this new nuclear. All right, all right. Thank you again, Professor Jacobson, and uh, I'd like to go to the conclusion of this uh, meeting. And uh, well, I express, of course, our gratitude uh, from University of Padua and University of Trieste uh, for your lecture. And uh, I enjoyed, we enjoyed that. Uh, in my opinion, uh, we are headed to a fossil fuel free world and we must run in that direction. And the problem until a few years ago was about technologies. As I understand, nowadays technologies are already available and the problem is deploying them rather than developing them. Uh, I was also very much interested about the, your comments about uh, things that uh, are usually thought as uh, a must in this transition, energy transition field, such as bioenergy or carbon capture and sequestration. And uh, this is again another interesting point that you, that you talked with today. So, uh, while uh, thank you again, thanking you again, and thanking all, all the people who connected and spent this hour for this lecture, I'd like to invite uh, all of you to attend, all of you Italians, of course, to attend the events of our center, Levi Cases, in the, in the future will be three events in, uh, in May. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Professor Jacobson, we are really, really grateful to you for your time, for your commitment, uh, uh, for being with us, uh, even though in the distance, uh, and, <laughs> and making us to understand better uh, your message and your uh, research activity. So if you would like to add something, that, that finish, that's over. And please. No, I just want to say thank you for inviting me. It's really great questions and good engaged discussion. Um, all right. I learned about yeah, some of what are people are thinking about and some of the issues that are important. And uh, so it's great that everybody's also on board with transitioning to renewables here. So th thank you again. It's really, I really appreciate it. So have a good time. Good luck and bye bye. From right. Italy. Arrivederci. Bye bye.